Ahmed Khan. <laughs> Um, so what I really want to talk about today is the things you can do within London because I find that a lot of people talk about property strategies and though in theory everything can be applied anywhere, I don't find many people speaking about what can be done within London. Uh, just by show of hands, how many people here are from London by the way? Okay, so pretty much the whole room and the people who are from London, how many people are looking to invest in London? You sort of shake your head, but a lot of people are kind of like up north. So it's 50-50. It's so I'm just trying to get everything covered. Um, like, like Graham said, I started off doing rent to service accommodation, and now I'm doing small developments within London. Now, I don't think one strategy is better than another, or there's a perfect strategy. I think your situation and your goals sort of you know, dictate what you should be doing at that particular time. So I'll give you an example. When I finished university in September 2016, my, my biggest goal at the time or objective was to have cash flow. I wasn't concerned about portfolios and uh, long-term capital growth and you know, the list goes on and on. My first objective was how do I make enough cash so I don't have to get a job? And if I don't have to get a job, I can spend more time doing this. <clears throat> so I think you know, that's what, how most people have to look at it in terms of what's your number one goal. And what's, once you know what that goal is, you can quite easily work backwards. Because when you get started in property, especially at the start, um, and you see someone doing HMOs and someone's doing buy to less and someone's doing service accommodation and commercial and, you know, there's so many different things, you sort of get a bit confused as to what you should be doing at that particular time. And I think by working out what your situation is and what you're trying to achieve, it just makes it far easier. So <clears throat> in terms of service accommodation, I've done Quite a few different deals. So this is in Victoria, this is in Hartford, Maida Vale, Stevenage, Paddington. And my model was very, very simple, which was I was renting properties and then I was renting them back out. So essentially called rent to service accommodation. And for me, that was really good, worked really well. I still do rent to service accommodation, but that's not the talk for today. That's another talk. I've done quite a few on those. What I want to talk about today is something different. It's more so the development strategy and <clears throat> It's kind of, I don't want to say inspired by this story, but there's a story that the first time they were, you know, the Americans were trying to go to space or trying to go to the moon, they were trying to make a pen which would help them write in space. So they spent millions and millions of pounds trying to so make this pen and they did all this research and engineering and they got all these people and all this research. It went on and on and on and they spent ages doing it and they finally made a pen which could basically write in space and you had no issues, right? And what do the Russians do? Does anyone know? Pencil. They use a pencil. So my, my story, my, the moral is sometimes it's just far easier to go with a simpler approach rather than digging and digging and digging. So. With everything in property, that's how I try to look at it. What's the simplest way? Now with property, I feel like sometimes people want to do the complicated thing because maybe it sounds a bit sexier or you want to sound like you're doing big things or you're, you know, so on and so on. Whereas sometimes you can do the small, simple things which still make very, very good money. And that's really helpful from a point of view if you're starting out. Like how many people here are just starting out in property? Just by a show of hands. Okay, quite a few. Like <clears throat> the people who are, you know, a bit more, um, people who've been in this a bit longer, you will know that if you're doing something like a commercial conversion or turning offices into apartments, if you're trying to get lending, what's one thing lenders look for? Experience. Experience, like you know, have you, have you done one before? And obviously if you're starting out in property, that's one of the things you haven't done before. So you have two options, either you work with someone else who has done it before, or you basically do something else where you don't require as much experience. And I think that's a good approach because if you start doing stuff which doesn't require as much experience, you'll learn along the way anyway. You make progress and you go from there. Now, one of the things I wanna talk about is when it comes to investing in property, what are some of the risks associated? Um, and any sort of risk, just shout them out and I'll make a list. because This will be helpful in terms of evaluating any type of deal. So what sort of risks are involved in property investing? Okay, so uncertainty. What else? What's that? Okay, so tenants. <clears throat> cool, we got tenants, which will be pretty much with any. Political changes. Okay, political changes, we'll just go with, with market uncertainty. Uh, yep, market uncertainty, what else? What about finance? Where do you get finance? Like, depends on your credibility. Okay, so finance risk. I would say it's less of a risk because if your finance has been approved previously, 
you'll be okay. However, let's say you're doing something, a development, and you have a, a bridging loan, for example, right? And if your development doesn't sell or it, it takes longer than you expected, then you have a massive finance risk because your, your short-term finance might be for 12 months and obviously you're, you're sort of running behind a bit. And in that case, yeah, you're right. Finance could be a massive risk. What else we got? Someone has some uh, ideas down here. Finance, what else? Okay, so interest rates could change, yep. Uh, interest, what else? <clears throat> okay, builders, uh, I'll put that in, could I put that in like development risk? Because for example, you know, let's say, let's go back to commercial conversions. By the way, I'm not picking on commercial conversions, I'm just using it as a particular example. Uh, because sometimes when you're starting out in property and you just want to do the big stuff, you don't look at some of these smaller details, right? So, you know, with a, with a development, commercial conversion, or building from ground up, there is a development risk as well. Because once you strip a building out, you don't necessarily know what it's going to be like and if you're going to be able to do what you think you're going to be able to do. Just to sort of speed this up, uh, one final one, I would say planning risk. Because if you're getting any sort of planning, there's, there is a massive, massive planning risk. And, you know, if we, if we spend some time on it, we can probably make the list even bigger and bigger and bigger. I've lost the clicker. Here we go. Okay. Uh, what I'm simply proposing is this, that I think we could all pretty much agree that as the risk goes up, generally the reward goes up as well. Yeah. The higher the risk, the higher the reward. So I've just put planning in top because, you know, in theory, if you think about it, is if you get a planning approval, that's going to add the most value. <coughs> It's going to cost the least amount of money, but it's going to add the most value. Because a planning application might cost you £10,000, but if you grant planning on something, that could be worth you know, a few hundred thousand pounds, depending on where that site is. So high risk, but also very high reward. And then at the same time, development risk might be lower, market uncertainty, you can argue is higher or lower, but you get the general gist, which is as the risk goes up, the reward also goes up. What I'm proposing is the strategy I'm talking about is is the lowest risk for the highest reward. Now, I put it here, could it be here, could it be here, I don't know. But that's what I want to talk about. The, the lowest risk, highest reward strategy you can possibly get, because if you're not taking much risk and you're still getting the upside, and if you do that again and again and again, you can make some pretty good returns. The reason I want to focus on protecting the losses is very simple, which I'll show you in a second. And I did the same thing with my service accommodation. How many people here do service accommodation, by the way? Okay, you know, with service accommodation, my number one thing was protecting the losses. Because if you, if you take a bad deal, you can easily be losing thousands, thousands of pounds every single month, and that's not really a situation you want to be in. And if you look at this diagram, which I find personally really interesting, <clears throat> the reason I'm very much against making losses, obviously everyone's against making losses, but some people are okay with taking a higher risk. I personally don't like taking massive risks, because let's just go with the last example here. So this first column says percentage loss, second says percentage gain. If you started off with 100 pounds and you lost half of that, how much are you left with? 50. 50. But now if you want to get back to 100, so you lost 50%, if you want to get back to 100, how much of a percentage gain is that? 100%. 100%. So if you lose 50% of your money, you now have to make 100% gain just to get back to where you were. You know, just to get back to where you started. But now obviously you've lost all that time and energy and so on and so on. And it just shows you the, the bigger the loss, the, the more you have to gain in order to recover just to get where you are. So that's the biggest reason I want to protect the downside because if you can cover the downside and you're not making a loss, hopefully you won't necessarily make the biggest gain because like I said, I didn't put my strategy up here. I'm not claiming this is going to make you the most money in property. I'm not claiming that because it, it doesn't. You know, things like planning game will make you far more money than something like this will. But what it will do is, it'll be very, very safe. You will have hardly any risk. And if you can keep repeating that again and again and again, build experience, build money over time, down the line you can move on to something, you know, which is bigger and riskier and maybe, you know, take more of a gamble. Process is very simple. I'm not going to spend too long on this. It's you're essentially purchasing a property you're adding value and then you're refinancing or you're selling. Now, what are the different ways you can typically add value to a property? Let's make, hold on, let me just make a quick list. Because, you see, 
pretty self-explanatory. Adding the value is really going to give you a margin um, if you're refinancing out later or if you're going to flip on and sell. Adding value, how would you add value? Extension. Okay, so uh, extension. And with extension, you can go down into the basement, you can go back, you can go up into the loft, various ways. Go. Okay, title space. Do you want to explain that a bit further for people who don't know? Basically, you take the old building, um, then you can split it into flats, then you can put a list, you can list it out to each individual and get the ground rent and then the pay. Yeah, essentially, essentially take a building which is under one freehold. So, you know, let's say there's four flats in a building, but they might be under, like you say, one title. Split them up. Uh, I, I guess, you know, if, you, if you're going to use an analogy, I guess it's, it's similar to if you buy a pack of Kit Kat chocolate bars, it's cheaper than if you were to buy an individual one. It becomes more expensive if you buy one than if you were to buy a pack of four. It, it, the same principle applies. But yeah, title split, what else we got? Planning gain. Uh, yeah, planning gain, cool, yeah. Uh, planning gain, refurb. To the current property to add more rooms. Okay, so. Um, reconfigure, add bedrooms. Okay, let's add that. Lease extensions. Who said lease extensions? Okay, yeah, so again, you know, lease extensions can add a lot of value because. Um, I think lease extensions, by the way, does everyone know what lease extensions mean? That's what we do, that's our main strategy. Okay. So, for someone who doesn't know, I think lease extensions is good for two reasons. So, you know, as you guys probably know, if you buy a flat in central London, or in London, or pretty much most places now, you normally have a lease for 120 years or 30 years. If you have a short lease, and obviously anything below, you can say 80 is short or below 70 is short, then you have to pay a premium just to get it back up to that original figure. So because it's a short lease, you get a much bigger discount. Uh, and once you extend it, it adds a lot of value. So yeah, lease extension. What else we got? Legals. What's that, sorry? No? Um, like legally, if there is something like with the, just to check all the legals if it's fine in terms of. Uh, if there's anything on the title and stuff? If there's anything on the title, those sort of things? If there's any problems like previously, uh, whoever was... Okay, I'll put it down. I don't know personally much, but I'll put it down. Yeah, I think what he's trying to say, you know, when they don't have kitchens and stuff, so basically you don't have... Oh, when something's unmortgageable? Unmortgageable. Okay. <coughs> unmortgageable, what else? Any other final ones? Permitted development. What's that, sorry? Permitted development, like Yeah, so I mean, permitted development will be typically under extension, title splits, those sort of things. But, but the list goes on and on. Now, the one I'm currently doing, the sort of stuff I'm basically doing is stuff like this. And I'll sort of, it's, it's pretty you know, simple to walk you through. This is the original uh, floor plan as it was. So as you can see, this is a one bedroom flat in London Bridge. Now, bedroom, Bathroom here, small toilet here, reception room, and the kitchen. Now, what I'm very, very simply doing is I'm taking <clears throat> this kitchen, I'm moving it along this wall, so into the living room, and then I'm turning the original kitchen into the bedroom. And what that's doing is it's, it's adding value, like someone mentioned, you mentioned here before, which is you're reconfiguring the layout and adding another bedroom. So now typically a two-bedroom property is worth more than a one bedroom property and it adds a lot of value. The reason I'm doing this strategy in London is, well, you know, let's just go through this. So we mentioned here before all the different reasons. One of them was planning gain. Now, there's no planning required in order to turn a one bedroom into a two bedroom flat because it's only internal reconfiguration. So there's no planning. By the way, if you have any questions, just shout them out through as we go or we can do some at the end as well because I really want to go a bit deeper in the Q&A. Um, there's no planning required because all you're doing is internal reconfiguration. Then at the same time, we mentioned development risk, which is again a massive one, right, with any sort of big development. Um, there is no development risk because, you know, internally nothing structural has happened. So 
even if you were going to do something structural, it wouldn't be major anyway. It's not like you're building from the floor up or you're stripping a building down or it's in a flat anyway. So it's not, you know, you're not going to have any of those issues. But at the same time, all you're simply doing is moving this kitchen from here to here. So having a structural issue is almost impossible. Um, so there's pretty much no or hardly any development risk. So no planning risk, no development risk. Now, one of the big ones is obviously market uncertainty. Brexit, coronavirus, the list goes on and on and on. Well, you can have two plans here. The plan A is to sell. You know, if, if that's what you want to do, you sell. And if you can't sell, based on your circumstance or whoever you're doing this with, these will meet the rental calculations and you can very, very easily refinance and hold on. Now, that's where we typically, we don't sell, we hold on to these units, but you can very easily as a plan B hold these units. So you mentioned the finance risk before. Let's say you're on a 12 month short term loan and you're you know, six months in, seven months in, eight months in and you're not able to sell. Well, as a plan B, you can refinance and you know, take a lot of your money out and hold the property for however long you wanna hold it for uh, and sell down the line at some other stage but you don't have the planning risk, you don't have the development risk, you don't have the market uncertainty, you don't have any of those challenges and you're adding a lot of value by simply moving um, the kitchen and adding the second bedroom. Any questions on that floor plan or anything? Go for it at the back. Okay, that's good, yeah. So that's, that's one thing you need, it's called freeholder consent. So if you wanna write down, you do need freeholder consent in order to get it. Now, what I would recommend to you is this. A lot of the stuff we buy is ex council. If you're buying ex council properties, it's very easy to check if you're gonna get planning, sorry, not planning, freeholder consent or not. Uh, because generally you can go into the council's website, it's, it's pretty black and white in terms of what they allow and what they don't allow. I'll give you an example. If you're in Westminster Council, uh, what they say is you can't move a kitchen um, where there might be a bedroom downstairs. So for example, let's say I said, can I move this kitchen here? They wouldn't allow that because downstairs would be a bedroom. And obviously it's making uh, a lot of noise for the person downstairs. So Westminster Council, has, Westminster Council has that, a lot of them don't. But again, it's pretty black and white from the council properties. Now we're also doing another one, which I don't think is council. And with a lot of these private freeholders, they don't let you ask the question until you have actually purchased it and you've become the new freeholder. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the past, what we've done is we've sort of asked the question and we've said, you know, is it in regards to this flat? They haven't asked, are you, are you the owner? Are you the leaseholder? They haven't asked the question and they've just given the information, which has been helpful. Uh, the second thing you can do is you can say, I'm not asking for consent. I'm asking for in principle that will this be okay? That for example, you know, here's the plans. In principle, do you see any issues because I'm about to buy it? so on and so on, and that works pretty well. Or the third one, as a complete backup, the person you're buying it from, you can possibly get them to email and say, you know, in principle, can you see any issues if we were gonna make these alterations? So yeah, you do need consent, uh, and that's how you would go about getting consent, whether it was private or whether it was council. Does that help? Brilliant, go for it. What's typically the minimum square footage or square meterage of the one bed that you turned to two? Okay, so this one doesn't say, I think this is about 46 square meters. Yeah. The smallest one we've done is about 42. I'm sure you can do probably even smaller than that. I think what it, it just depends on how big the kitchen is really and how big you know, the living room is. It's like you can get away with a smaller bathroom and those sort of things, but those two rooms are kind of important here because, do I have a picture? I've got one on my phone, but not on the, on the presentation here. We did one in Battersea where the kitchen initially was pretty small. I still managed to get a double bed. I've showed you this one, actually. I got a wardrobe, a side table, and a double bed in there, but, but it was a bit of a squeeze. You know, it was a bit of a squeeze. So around 40 plus, I'd say, 40 square meters plus. So there's, yeah, there's a minimum requirements for rooms, but I think it's for HMOs as opposed to um, if you're just gonna do a standard buy to let. So, but yeah, I would say about 40 plus, but you know, the, obviously the bigger the better. Um, and sometimes you can get one bed which, which you can turn into three beds, which is like, you know, now seriously good, but they have to be really about 60 square meters plus. 
And if, if, the, if the layouts are good, you can turn them into three beds, which would be pretty ideal. Any other questions on that? Someone else had their hand up. Some, some mortgage companies, um, you have to have a minimum of 50 yeah. square feet for a one bedroom. OK. They won't, they won't refinance if it isn't 50 square feet or more. OK, interesting. So yeah, yeah. Don't get caught out on that. Yeah. You've had the same? Yeah, so so like I said, yeah, like I said, as a, you know, as a bare minimum, I've had I want to get at least a double bed in there, a wardrobe in there, and side tables in there. So which generally means that the room sizes are okay. So you know, if you can't even get those sort of things in there, then it might be a classified as a 1.5 bedroom you know, one and a half, a, a double and a single. But obviously, if, you, if you're trying to get the valuation, then you really want something. Now, this one's ideal, if you think about it. This is like nine square meters. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with this one. It's, you walk into it, it's a, it's a full-on bedroom. That's, that's what we've done there. This was the initial living room. This was the initial living room, which is now turned into this. So it's slightly zoomed in. Um, it's taken from like, not half the room, but you know, like one third in, but all you've simply done is move the kitchen here um, and turn the living into an open plan living room. This was the original bedroom. So again, you know, the original bedroom was pretty good size, which is now turned into a pretty simple refurb to be fair. Now this is the kitchen. See, as you can see, the kitchen on this one was pretty good size. So turning this into a bedroom is not really a, much of a challenge and you know, like I said, this one has uh, a desk, a bed, two side tables, and the wardrobe. I mean, if you can even get a desk in there, then it's a really good sized bedroom. Yeah. So that one works pretty well. This was a bathroom, which is a bit weird. And then it's just turned into a bathroom. That's the toilet, and I don't know if you can see on the floor plans here. The toilet had like a toilet followed by like a wardrobe sort of thing with a stud partition in the middle. So the builder knocked that out. And, and he turned into, by the way, this is, there's, no, there's not two sinks in there. It's just, uh, no, it's not even Photoshopped. It's actually, what's that? Yeah, it's two, it's, two, it's two photos merged together because in one photo you can't see the whole thing because it obviously is very narrow. Uh, and, and the door sort of like in the middle. But, you know, again, it's, it's got a shower now. It's got a sink mirror and a toilet, which was previously just this. So effectively, it's turned from a one bed, one bath into a two bed, two bath. So, uh, and, and that's a view to the shard and it's you know, in pretty good location. So from every single room, you, can, you have a clear view of the shard. There's a park outside, looks pretty nice. I don't know. Um, that's that flat there, go for it. Uh, what, sorry, what's the simple matter for an email? Okay, with the freeholder. Now, <coughs> well, well, this one, because it's, it's in London Bridge, this is Southwark Council. <coughs> so with Southwark Council, uh, as far as I remember, because we've done a few different councils now, as far as I remember, you essentially just have to fill in some forms. You have to apply, you have to submit your forms and they kind of just ask you, what are you looking to do, so on and so on. Now, keep in mind something with the floor plans. Sorry, I'm going to have to take back here. With the floor plans, if you, if you see something, I haven't done anything structural here, right? All I've simply done is a move kitchen from here to here. Now, the way some people do this is, this floor plan was pretty good, but sometimes floor plans are not as good as this. Mm -hmm. Sometimes what happens is, this wall might be about here, right? Living room will be massive, kitchen will be very narrow. And obviously, in that case, you can't turn into a two bed because the kitchen is so narrow. The only way you can do this is by taking this wall, obviously there isn't a wall, I'm just making this up. You take this wall out and you move it here, right? Now, that means now you're doing something which is structural, i.e. you're knocking a wall out. Mm -hmm. So now when you submit your plans by knocking a wall out, it becomes a bit more complicated mm -hmm. because now they want structural surveys, they want the engineers in there, they want all these things done to make sure that it's not a, um, what's the word? Like yes, it. yeah, that thing, yeah. Yeah, they want to make sure it's not one of those. Because the problem with a lot of these old buildings is everything's brick inside. 
It's not like you can just go around and kind of knock your finger on it and you know, just know if it's stuttered or not. It's like everything's brick. So you've got to send a guy in there to work out if it's structural, if it's not structural, you know, but that sort of stuff. But other than that, it's very straightforward. I mean, with something like this, it's very straightforward because there's nothing structural. Structural isn't necessarily just walls. It can also mean uh, the communal services. It can mean the pipes. Are you moving any pipes around from the outside? Internally, you can do whatever you want, but are you moving any external pipes? Because they don't want, you know, because think of a council building or uh, any building, everything runs in the same line. The pipes and, you know, all that sort of stuff runs in one line. So you can't then just, for your flat, alter that one and change the connections up. So again, you know, uh, the sink was here. Now the sink, I believe, is here. So all you do is, I don't know, the water, I, I don't know. Those sort of things, I don't know, the builder does it, but. Uh, I suppose he probably just did some sort of connection and it just goes through. Is any builders in here or anything? How did you deal with the boiler, the water and everything in here? We changed it to electric. Right. Yeah, we changed it. Electric, hot water. Oh, you see, okay, these questions I don't know. Um, uh, anything to do with that sort of stuff, I really don't know. Like, once someone said to me, you know, what's the flooring? And I was like, oh, I have no idea. I don't know. So, by the way, I don't, uh, I shouldn't say this, but I don't like going to properties much. Um, I don't like to leave the house much and that sort of stuff. Like, I've seen this property when it looked like this. I've not seen it when it looks like this, so I don't know. I don't know what the flooring is or um, how stuff was moved and so on and so on. People find it very bizarre, but I've, uh, I'm, I said to someone, I actually live in Stevenage. I'm living in London for three days. Uh, in one of my properties right now and my friend's living with me and he came in and we actually both saw it for the first time ever like you know and I just just not a massive fan of doing viewings and going and checking up on builders and some so on that and sometimes you know you can go there and the grouting might be a bit off and so on and so on but yeah anyway um, so those sort of things I really have no idea anything to do with build uh, gas, I don't know. I don't know how the water works. Uh, I honestly have no idea. Go for it. Yeah, sorry, at some point when you're going to sell the property, um, and the potential buyer has, has to do their searches and so forth, they're going to see the original plan before. How, how, how would you register your new, say, plans to the council or to your solicitor? Would you do that? The solicitor will do that, and what will happen is obviously uh, the council signs off on it. So when we apply for freeholder consent, we're telling them we're reconfiguring this and doing what we're doing. And the solicitors then sort of get involved and they kind of do their bit. Right, so that happens obviously before then. Yeah, so because obviously we apply for consent before we can do the works. Okay, I didn't know how it would Yeah, yeah, so what, what happens is, what happens is we, you know, initially in principle, we, we do, we check that, you know, is it going to be okay? Because the council has a checklist normally and uh, this was fine. And then we buy it, or in principle, we ask the question. And then we, uh, when, during the buying phase, up till exchange, we sort of start applying for these things, and we get consent because they also want building regs people in there just to check it's all done and so on and so on. And then they sign off on the whole thing, and that's how it's pretty much done. And then the solicitors will kind of get involved in, uh, you know, do whatever needs to be done with the papers. I don't even know. I don't. I don't know what that is, but they'll sort of. I'll tell you. Huh? Tell Does anyone want to know? <laughs> <laughs> you can do. It's quite, 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 quite interesting because when you get a lease on a property, sometimes you get an outline of the property and sometimes you get a physical floor plan like this. That's very true. So, pe so people who get the so the t a top tip, well, no. Anyway, if you, if you can find leases that actually don't have any of the demarcation of the rooms, you can actually do other bits and pieces. Um, if you've got a demarcation of the rooms, then when you get the new floor plan, the solicitor will add it as an addendum to the lease. Yeah. So that's what happens to your new floor plan. It gets added to the back of the lease. And it then goes up. So when you go on to land registry, you can then download it. Yeah that's, yeah, that's a good point. I have seen those, which is, you're absolutely right, which is, it'll just say this. It'll just show you the boundary of the flat. They're the amazing ones to have. Yeah, yeah. And it, especially, you know, if internally the whole thing was partitioned as well, because then uh, we saw one in Kennington recently, which was, uh, imagine a box with everything inside partition, li literally a, a square with everything inside partition. 
um, not even brick partition, but like you know, like stud partition. And the lead span, I believe, if I remember correctly, was something like what you're saying, which was the just the just the outline, not the internal rooms. And uh, you know, you can pretty much do whatever you want. And the space is so much better than it was previously designed. So much hallway space, wasted space, uh, and it goes on and on. So yeah, this went from a one bed, one bath into effectively now, you know, a two bed, two bath. And it added, I don't know, quite a bit of value. Let's go. Okay, so in terms of numbers, in terms of the ones we've done, in terms of the numbers, this is probably the worst one. But if I show you what well, from our point of view is the worst one, and it's still, in my opinion, stacks up, then it can kind of give you an image of, <clears throat> well, if you were to do more and more and more, how would that look for you and how would that work for you? And how would you sort of try to scale this up? So we bought this for 330. The brief was 30,000 uh, pounds. Other costs, which include, you know, the stamp duty and the finance cost and the legal cost, that came to just under 40,000. Uh, and it was valued at 450. Now, we have, a, we have another flat, which, we, which was bought years ago, that was also remortgaged two months before across the road. Slightly bigger, slightly bigger than this one, um, but it was two bed, one bath, and that was valued at 500. So we thought we were gonna get close to the 500 mark, that's what we were hoping for, but again, it's like, you know, with everything which is happening right now, from a values point of view, they're not giving you the top valuations, they're giving you what they think is conservative, and that could be 10 plus, plus or minus, 10% above, above or below. So we had something across the road, slightly bigger, but valued at 500. So we thought we might get 470, 475, but again, in the end, we got 450, which, you know, again, it's, it's gone up by 120,000 pounds in the space of four months, but it, it could have been even better. Um, the rent on this is 1,800. Now, again, I've done a lot of service accommodation stuff. I've done service accommodation for three years, and I've got a lot of connections with bigger companies and agencies, so on and so on. My next tenant in this property is there for nine months. So we do everything from, from a rent's point of view, we do six months plus. Uh, is in there for nine months, paying us 2,800 per month. The reason I put 1,800 is because if you go into right move in that area, the market rent is about 1,800. But I come from the service accommodation side of the world where obviously we know how you can charge a premium for different type of things. And right now I'm getting 2,850 per month. But I'll stick, with, I'll stick with 1,800 because if you're in a different area or different part of London and you don't achieve the same, you can still base your figures on this as opposed to what you could possibly get as a premium. So we'll run with this. Um, the money left in was 60,000 pounds. Again, I thought it would be lower, but that's what the valuation came out to be. So what that simply means is once it's been refinanced, I've got 60,000 pounds left in the property. The amount of equity created is 52,000 pounds. So you've made on paper 52,000 pounds. Obviously, you, un, it's not realized until you actually sell the property, but on paper, you made 50, 52,000 pounds in a space of a few months by moving a kitchen, essentially. You haven't done any big development or any plan, you haven't taken any chances with planning, and so on and so on, and it's made 52,000. The net monthly cash flow is 600, and again, I'm basing this on the 1800 figure as opposed to my much higher figure, so we'll run with 600. And based on the fact that I've left in 60,000 pounds, it's making 600 pounds per month, that's a 12% return on the, on the money left in from a cash flow point of view. So just from a cash flow point of view, it makes 12%. Now, you know, based on what you can get in a bank and based on how much your, um, I don't know, people are offering you and so on and so on, making 12% every single year is, is pretty good to me. This is based on the potential capital growth. So now I've assumed, let's say the market moves by 10%. Now keep in mind, it's like, obviously no one knows where it's gonna go, but I'm just, if you're investing in London, if you're holding property in London, you're not doing it for the cash flow. You obviously, if you make a good return and you make good cash flow, that's good. But you're not necessarily doing it just for that reason. You wanna make sure your cash flow is covered because you know, if the market goes down and interest rate goes up and so on and so on, you wanna make sure you're safe. But one of the reasons people are holding in London is for the potential capital growth, because that's where people are you know, gonna bank in big, big time. So I've made an assumption here, let's say the market goes up by only 
Keep in mind 2013, 14, 15, 16, it was going up more than 10% every single year. But let's just say it goes up by 10% in however long that is, one year, two year, three year. If it goes up by 10%, that's another 73% return on your investment, plus the 12% every single year. So you haven't taken any chances, you haven't taken any risk, but you're making 12% every single year, you're potentially making 80% every time it goes up by 10%. And in, in terms of scaling this, it's the simplest option is this. You simply find an investor who is happy to leave in the 60,000 pounds. By the way, some of the ones we've done, we've left in about 30,000 pounds, but let's run with these numbers. You get someone to leave in 60,000 pounds and you go 50-50, a hypothetical case. If you were to do that, the person who left in 60,000 pounds they get a 6% return every single year, which is still in this market very good. And they possibly get another 36% every time it goes up. Again, no one's taking any big chances here, but you're making 6% and 36% every time the market goes up. And again, you know, like I said, if the valuation came in slightly better and so on and so on, those numbers would look even better. But let's just run with what it is. Let's not go with hypotheticals and if you can charge premium rents and so on and so on. Let's just run with whatever we have. And that's kind of the case in point. So that's how you would look to do more and more of these. And again, you're not doing anything fancy here. You're just replicating a simple system which works again and again. And, you know, in the last 16 months, we've done the one in London Bridge, we've done uh, one in Battersea, again, very, very similar. You can just see this was the living room and this is now turned into open plan. You can just see the edge of the kitchen, which is uh, completely along this wall here. Exactly the same kitchen as London Bridge, same thing. It's just along this wall, same project. This is the one we did in Brixton. Again, so this was the living room, which is now turned into open plan. Again, pictures are really crap, aren't they? Uh, you can just see the edge of the kitchen here. Can you see that? Yeah. Just, just on the edge, you can see uh, the, the end of the kitchen. It's just the guy couldn't, I don't know, zoom in or something. I don't know. Um, but again, exactly the same thing, the same model. You see, one of the things with property is what I find is people find something which works and then they do it a couple of times and then they go and do something else. And they do that once and then they want to change areas and then they want to do something else. And, you know, it's very, very hard to scale something when you're chopping and changing all the time. It's like you have to stick to one thing and do that again and again and again until you get very good at that thing and then move on to the next. When I did about 40 service combination units in the first couple of, well, in the, first, in the last three years, it was the same thing. It was the same model again and again. It was the same areas. It was the same two-bedroom flat. It was the same furniture. And you find something which works and you just replicate again and again. And I find what happens with the property is people do one thing here, then they do a bit of here, and they do a bit of this, and a bit of this, and one's in London, one's in the north, one's in Southampton, and it's very, very hard. Is that you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry if it is, but it's, it's just very, very hard to scale that, because you know, you're thinking of so many different things, whereas if you can find a model which works and build a team around that, doing another one, another one is very easy. Like, if you, I don't know if you've noticed something, uh, all the sofas are, you know, pretty much the same. Like, if I go back, well, I can't go back anymore, it's too far. This, yeah, the lamps are the same, and the tables are the same, and fine, this one's a bit gold, and this one's not gold, but the kitchens are the same, the builders are the same, and all you simply have to do is take something which works and replicate again and again. So we did, we did London Bridge, we did Battersea, we did Brixton, um, this, this is the one in Vauxhall. Again, the same lamps, the same kitchen in the corner, the same table, uh, and it's just very, very easy to replicate something based on a model which works, and that's the one in Vauxhall. This is the next one we have coming up, which is in uh, West Hampstead. This, I think, will probably be our best one, I believe, in terms of the margin. I'll be done in two seconds and I'll jump on the questions. And um, that's the next one we're gonna do, which will be the fifth one in the last 16 months. And again, it's, you know, it took us a long, long time to work out how everything worked. It's more than a year. Um, we looked at different areas, we looked at different strategies, we looked at shall we turn you know, a one into a two, shall we turn a two into a three, a three into a four, do we do private, do we do council? You know, there's so many of these small things you've got to work out and that takes a long, long time. But once you've worked something out, it's just a case of getting the finance and doing another one, another one, another one. Um, just two, I don't know, call to actions or whatever you want to call it. The first one, any deal packages in the room? 
Okay, anyone who does deal packaging, I'm more than happy to speak to you and see if we can find more of these. And if we can find more of these, obviously, you know, we'll do whatever your fee structure is and go from there. Uh, the second one, we have a program which is a learn to earn. So if you want to learn more about this, then what you can basically do is you can invest in our next project where you get a fixed return and you also learn the entire process. So how you find these deals, how you evaluate them, how you you know, make sure you're going to get consent. There's so many of these small things which you kind of have to go through, how to finance, um, how to structure the finance, how to get bridging. The list goes on and on and the people you need to do it. So if you want to work with us in our next project and learn the entire process as well, come and speak to me after. Or if you don't want to invest and you only want to learn, then come and speak to me after as well and we can work something out. And these are my contact details if you want to get in touch. That is everything from me, so thank you very much. Thank you, Annie.